Hi guys, Dr. Mattis here today. I want to start my series of videos on covalent bonding. Our last video that I did about bonding, which is general about all bond types, this is specific to covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is a slew of different topics, and this one we're just going to talk about drawing those Lewis structures, the three-dimensional structural formulas of covalent molecules. But you see before you got the periodic table there with a couple guys highlighted, those are nonmetals. Only nonmetals covalently bond, okay? And so what we're going to talk about basically is H, C, N, O, and F, realizing that silicon below carbon behaves like carbon, phosphorus and arsenic are going to behave like nitrogen, sulfur, selenium, to a lesser extent, tellurium, all behave like O, and likewise, all these guys below iodine, chlorine, bromine, they all below fluorine, they all behave like fluorine. Acetine down here is radioactive, barely lasts, 19 second half life. Polonium, same idea, radioactive, and these guys are synthetic anyway. So if you know sort of how these guys react, the ones in yellow, then you can pretty much draw all structures of everybody else. All right. We're going to ignore boron for just a moment. Boron and aluminum can do some covalent bonding. They're a little bit different because they don't form octets. They only form three pairs of electrons around themselves rather than four. Hydrogen never forms an octet, just a duet, but he's kind of like salt and pepper on a potato. You know, there's just things that you add, not the main focus. Okay. So anyway, let's get into these structures. All right. First off, for structural formulas, there are two definitions you should know because you've got to bring them up at some point in time. You have isomers and resonance. Okay. Resonance is one specific form of isomerization, isomers. Isomers are things that have the same atoms, but different connectivity. Like maybe as a kid, you learn glucose and for you learn sugars were C6H12O6. Well, that's a molecular formula. The structural formula, the way all those atoms are arranged in space, they differ and they make glucose, fructose, galactose, a bunch of different sugars. So how they're arranged in space matters. But as an, a simpler example, let's look at C2H6O. If you notice, it's either CCO is the main backbone in there with some H's hanging off, or option B, COC with some H's hanging off. And the difference is huge. The one on the left is ethanol, okay, drinking alcohol that's sold all over the United States and the world in various beverages, okay, for adults, all right. The other is dimethyl ether. Ethanol is a liquid at room temperature. Dimethyl ether, gas. They're both poisonous, but I mean, people ingest ethanol for whatever reason. You would never ingest dimethyl ether, okay. <laughs> so they're vastly different structures based upon that connectivity. All right, but if you notice, there's just one little line between them. I know it's smaller, but there's just one little line between them holding them together. Well, sometimes there's more than one little line. There's like double bonds. That's where we get into resonance. Resonance is a specific case of isomerization. The connectivity is the same, but those extra bonds, the lone pairs, those little sets of dots, those electrons, or the extra little lines, well, those move, okay? So if you notice the one on the left here, this guy had, look where there's a triple bond between C and N, single bond between C and O. Alrighty, you got two double bonds there. All right, here are the triple bonds between the C and O, and there's a single bond between the C and the N. They're all forming octets. They're all going from four pairs of electrons to be S2, P6, to have two electrons in the S, three electrons in the P's. I mean, six electrons in the P's, three pairs, okay? But which, like... How do you know which one is the right structure? Okay, some are better, some are worse. Odds are in the resonance, usually the molecule bounces back and forth between a lot of those resonance forms. It's just uh, how much time is spent in one particular form over another. Alrighty, one of the ways you can figure that out is through formal charge. Okay, a formal charge, if you're an AP student, maybe do a little bit of formal charge. Typically, this is more of an upper level gig. If you're a first year high school student, odds are you're not going to do formal charge unless you're some kick bump school, you know, really solid program that's got to just make everything difficult. Formal charge is basically you look at the valence electrons, what it's bringing into the structure, minus uh, everything it has. Half of the shared pairs and all of the lone pairs. If you did those calculations in the previous example that I showed you about resonance, okay, you would see that of our three forms, you have a bunch of different charges down here. Well, remember what we know about electronegativity and that you have NOFCLBR. F is the most electronegative, then O. O is the second most electronegative on the planet. So he's going to be really good at pulling electrons to himself, at having electrons. So if anybody's going to be negative in the structure, the more electronegative atom should be. Well, he is there. 
okay? Since these are covalent bonds, odds are you shouldn't really be building up charges. Well, there's a charge here because it's the, an ion. It's a cyanate ion. So it's a one negative. So that's why it always ends up to be a one negative. So the question is whether you got a one negative charge on the O or the N. Probably on the O, he's more electronegative. This whole idea that you have a positive and another two negative, well, first off, O is electronegative. He's not really going to give up electrons very easily. And secondly, it's covalent. We kind of want formal charges to be really near zero to be stable. Okay, so what you had there is th where the O has the lone pairs. That's a more stable structure. And so odds are the greater proportion of those ab those molecules, those diacyanate, those cyanate ions, are going to have that resonance form. Okay, sometimes they might pop into this at a higher energy state or something like that. They'll pop right back to the more stable state. All right, don't get caught up in that. Let's just learn how to draw a structure. If you're a first year high school student, odds are you got to learn how to draw a structure. Okay. So, there are two methods to draw a structure, the hard method and the easier method. The harder method, you really have to do if you're ever going to expand octets later. Uh, a lot of teachers like the first method, this thing that I'm going to go over with you. As an organic chemist, nah, I'm not so bent out of shape on this one. Okay, Basically, what this boils down to, if you've been reading while well, I've been chit-chatting, is it adds up valence electrons and deals with completing octets based upon the number of valence electrons that you have available. Okay, You're going to determine the geometry of that thing using an LAX chart. LAX chart basically focus on this part right now. It's the number of lone pairs on the central atom. That's the L. Okay. And then the number of other atoms on the central atom. Okay. Like if you had water, H, O, H, the H's are the other atoms attached to the O. And depending upon where you are in that chart, you can assign geometries. Okay. These are things that you get used to doing as you do it. Okay. You'll slowly memorize them. The second method is typically more like what an organic chemist does. If you have a larger molecule with lots of central little hub points that things branch off from, typically you sort of have an idea of how they should look. Okay, and this is what I teach my students to do for things that obey the octet rule, things that are not going to expand the octets and use d orbitals. All right, you basically go with those atom pieces H, C, N, O, F. For the most part, they only have typical geometries associated with them, okay? And they are listed down below there. They can be, you know, linear. All of them can be linear if everything's straight, so that's going to be obvious. But carbon tends to be tetrahedral trigonal planar. Nitrogen, you get some pyramidal action. Oxygen could be vent. It could be bent, all right? So basically, by the family, the families tend to dictate the geometries. And what happens here is, if you look, the single electrons are going to pair up. All we do is we draw them down and say, hey, single electrons pair to form a pair. All right. So let's look at examples and you see what I mean by my prattling on. Okay. Say we have formaldehyde, H2CO. Let's draw the structure of formaldehyde. All those atoms obey the octet rule because they're in row two of the periodic table. You can use any method to solve them. If you look, it looks like C is going to be the middle. H's and the O's are going to be hanging off. Okay. The first method is valence electrons, so you need to go through there and add up the valence electrons. How do you get the valence electrons? Well, let's screw up all my slides and go up here. Group one would be one valence electron. That's one. Carb, then you get two, three, four, five, six. Whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You just count the number of valence electrons in the row, ignoring the D block because they're one energy level down. So let's see if I can find out where I was before. Okay, so H has one valence electron, carbon four, oxygen six. You get that from the periodic table. If you add them up, you get a total, divide by two to make pairs, and we end up with six pairs of electrons. So let's bond everything to the central atom first. Okay, carbon's going to be the center because he's the least electronegative. Okay, that's kind of hard for some people to get, but remember, electronegativity increases over and up. Your least electronegative one, that is never H, goes in the middle. In this case, that's C. We connect everybody to him, and that's one, two, three bonds. Six minus three, three pairs left. Next thing we want to do is complete the octets on that puppy. Okay? Well, when we complete the octets on it, uh, you need to put one, two, three octets on that oxygen atom. Okay? Up here, we had three pairs left. We need to complete the octets. Well, we're going to start with the most electronegative atom. That's the oxygen, and that's how we end up with those three 
pairs of electrons on the oxygen. When we do that math, we end up with zero pairs remaining. So now we're kind of messed up. Well, we need to complete octets on everybody, but carbon doesn't have an octet. You can't just slam some electrons in there to complete oxygen's octet because you don't have any electrons left. Okay, the line represents an electron pair. You have one, two, three electron pairs around the carbon. We need to get a fourth electron pair. Well, where is he going to come from? Well, I don't know. If you look, okay, we started here, okay, we completed the octets and got there. We're out of electron pairs. Maybe we can pop that puppy over and share an electron pair. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to share to complete carbon's octets, and that creates the double bond. The set of dots becomes a straight line because now it's being shared. Cool. So bond, connect them all together, complete the octets from the outside in, so to speak, the most electronegative atoms first. If you need to complete octets, you're going to share. Okay, you can assign the geometry. If you look at this guy, we got a central atom with one, two, three guys attached already. The lone pairs are on the oxygen, they're not on the carbon. So this would be L0, AX3, and we bag the L part, we just say it's AX3, and back on that chart, you would see that he's trigonal planar. In the second example, the way I like to do it is you draw the atom pieces. You have H, C, and O. H has one valence electron, okay? Carbon has four valence electrons, so we draw four. And the oxygen has his six. Two are paired, two are single. How do we know that? Well, because, man, you learned energy level diagrams once upon a time. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six elect valence electrons. There are the two pairs. There are the two signals. Alrighty. Once you have those pieces, you then are going to connect single electrons up and, and share them. Connect to this middle. Okay, bond, and just draw them up. Don't bond those two together because then you can't attach anything. The thing is to make one big puzzle piece. How do you know carbon's in the middle? Well, he makes the most connections, so he'd be like in the middle of our puzzle. So let's connect everything to carbon. Alrighty, and so we can go, hey, one, two, three, and we can make connections. And we say, hey, wait, still need one more. So we bond everything up to carbon. Alright, you don't leave it that way. That looks awful. All right, you need to pretty it up and spread the atoms around. So we spread them out and we draw it like that. Okay, some teachers will let you draw it this way, H, C, double bond, O, H. Me, with my students, I don't like it drawn that way because it looks like a T and that's not really what it is. There's a lot of empty space up in here and those, bond, those atoms are going to move up into that space and they're going to spread out. And if you look at it, it looks almost like a little Y shape. And that Y shape, I teach my students, that is going to be trigonal planar, okay? That is trigonal planar for carbon. If it was this shape, then that would be tetrahedral, okay? But again, you can get it from the AX, LAX stuff. If you look at carbon, he's still going to be AX3 and be, you know, trigonal planar, okay? Uh, that's about it, guys. I mean, you can... That's it. <laughs> Have a lovely day. Take care.